The Holy Spirit spoke very clearly to me to disrupt the sermon series that I was doing to address this topic, this idea of the last days. And I want to talk about the last days in the context of the work of the Holy Spirit in the last days. So I want you to share this message with your friends, post it on your Facebook, share it all over social media, email it, text it to people. I'm going to be addressing this topic of the last days because we are living in very uncertain times. People are becoming fearful, but the scripture tells us that perfect love casts out all fear. God is in control. There are wars and rumors of wars. There are earthquakes. There are all sorts of natural disasters taking place in our world. And there is a lot of uncertainty all around. But I want to tell you again, God is in control. So I want to talk to you about the last days and the work of the Holy Spirit in the last days. You don't want to miss this message. This is something that I believe is a prophetic word. As I said to you, the Holy Spirit spoke very clearly to me. He wants me to talk about this subject, and I know it's going to bless you. It's going to bring peace to your heart, clarity to a lot of the questions, and it's going to embolden you to become a witness for Christ. Stephen Moctezuma is here with me as usual. He's going to lead you in worship, and then we're going to get right back into this lesson. As you worship, let the peace of God fill your heart. Here is Stephen Moctezuma. Lord, I'm amazed by you. Lord, I'm amazed by you. Lord, I'm amazed by you. How you love me. Lord, I'm amazed. I know we are living in troubling times. You know what I'm talking about. There are earthquakes, natural disasters, hurricanes, political unrest. There's the threat of nuclear war. And this is causing fear to infect the hearts of many people all around the world. And sadly, fear is infecting the hearts of many believers who should be filled with faith in this hour. 
and we are becoming a fearful people. People are becoming paranoid. You look online and you see people's conspiracy theories concerning the last days. You see videos about the signs of the times. They show all of the natural disasters. They highlight all of the chaos and they play dramatic music, all with the goal of warning people about the coming of the Lord, which is a noble cause. And we are to look to the coming of the Lord and the coming of the Lord could come at any moment. Jesus could come back before this video finishes. Yes, that is the truth. But now is not the time to be fearful. Now is the time to be faith filled. Now is the time to reach out and begin winning souls. I want to talk to you about the last days, specifically about the Holy Spirit's work in the last days. But first, I want to set the record straight on some things. I want to bring clarity where there is a lot of noise and a lot of chaos and a lot of confusion. Concerning the topic of the last days, there are a lot of thoughts. There are a lot of passages of scripture that can be interpreted a lot of different ways. So you scroll through your Facebook feed, you scroll through whatever social media feed you're on, and you'll see videos about the earthquakes. You'll see videos about the hurricanes. You'll see videos about the eclipse and the constellations and the blood moons. I don't know how many times I've been warned about blood moons since I've been on Facebook during these times. And I'm not trying to mock the idea that Jesus could come at any moment, but I do want to bring balance to the issue. So on one hand, the scripture tells us that certainly we are to be alert. We are to be aware. We're not to be caught off guard. We're not to be ignorant. The day of the Lord is not to surprise us like it surprises the sinner. The scripture says in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 4 through 6, but you aren't in the dark about these things. Dear brothers and sisters, you won't be surprised when the day of the Lord comes like a thief. For you are all children of the light and of the day. We don't belong to darkness and night. So be on your guard, not asleep like the others. Stay alert and be clear headed. Now, is this scripture saying that we will know when the Lord is returning? No, it simply says that we will not be surprised. Why? The scripture makes it very clear. It tells us, so be on your guard, not asleep like the others. If we were to know the day and the hour that Christ was coming back, we wouldn't have to be on our guard constantly. But we are not caught off by the day of the Lord, not because we know the exact day and the hour, but because we are living in the light of the return of Christ. We are living with a constant awareness that he could come at any moment. Now, on the other hand, the Bible also tells us that no man knows the hour or the day that Jesus will return. Matthew chapter 24, verse 36 says, However, no one knows the day or hour when these things will happen. Not even the angels in heaven or the Son himself, only the Father knows. So don't be confident about these predictions that are floating around online. Don't put your confidence in those things. Jesus made it clear, you're not going to know the day or the hour. Be alert, but you're not going to know the day or the hour. He's talking about living in preparation for the return. He's talking about living in the state of readiness for when he comes back to this world. Now, I think it's ironic that people criticize those who talk about the last days. I'll tell you what I mean. You'll see somebody predict, foolishly I might add, the Lord is coming at such and such date and such and such time. And they are very confident about their predictions. I remember one time there was this group that was going around predicting these, these final days and they thought they had the exact day, the exact hour. And I was talking to one of the people who were protesting or preaching, whatever they were doing. They had their signs and they're warning everybody. And I have to respect the fact that they believed it sincerely and were out there doing something about it. Still, they were very wrong. And so I went to them and I said, if you really believe this, why don't you sell your houses, use the money to spread the message? They didn't do that. But what I find ironic is the people who criticize those who predict such dates. Now, I do criticize them in the fact that they're not supposed to be predicting uh, by the date when the Lord is returning. No man knows the hour. What I do find interesting is that people are so confident that the Lord is not coming back on that day. So I don't think we can have confidence either way, whether or not the Lord is coming on any certain day. So we can't criticize those who predict and say, well, the Lord is definitely not coming back on that day. He could come back on that day, they're predicting, but they don't even know it themselves. So we have to have this balance. We cannot be confident that he is certainly coming on a certain day, and we cannot be confident that he is not coming on that certain day. We have to treat every day as if it is possible, because it is, that the Lord 
is returning. Now, in fact, the Lord's return will be at a time of peace. I'm going to show you from the scripture here why it's important to not panic and why it's important to trust the words of Jesus. Because while many are out there panicking, looking at the signs and becoming fearful, the scripture says in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 2 through 3, For you know quite well that the day of the Lord's return will come unexpectedly like a thief in the night. When people are saying everything is peaceful and secure, then disaster will fall on them as suddenly as a pregnant woman's labor pains begin and there will be no escape. So the coming of the Lord is preceded by a time of peace and security. Continuing now, because we can look at Daniel, we can look at scriptures in Isaiah, we can look at scriptures in Thessalonians, we can look at scriptures in Revelation, and there is a lot of apocalyptic imagery, there is a lot of prophetic vision, there is a lot of, there are a lot of things that can be interpreted many different ways. So how do you find clarity on a topic like this? Well, we have to look at what Jesus said, because the disciples pointed the question to Jesus directly. They weren't talking symbolically. They weren't talking metaphorically. They weren't talking in apocalyptic imagery. They very clearly pushed the question to Jesus. In this way, look at Matthew chapter 24, beginning at verse number three. The scripture says, Later Jesus sat on the Mount of Olives. His disciples came to him privately and said, Tell us, when will all this happen? What sign will signal your return and the end of the world? Now, the disciples are asking him three questions here, but I want to focus on the two questions they asked him concerning his return and the final days of the world. Now, verse 4, Jesus says, Don't let anyone mislead you, for many will come in my name, claiming I am the Messiah. They will deceive many. And you will hear of wars and threats of wars, but don't panic. Now, here we see Jesus warns that there will be those that claim to be the Messiah. That's happening today. And then he says, and you will hear of wars and threats of wars, but don't panic. We're hearing of wars now. We're hearing of threats of wars now. Jesus says, but don't panic. He says, yes, these things must take place, but the end won't follow immediately. Interesting that we point to wars and rumors of wars as signs of the end times. Yet Jesus says, and I like the way he words it in the King James Version, or the way the King James Version phrases what Jesus said, the end is not yet. In other words, these are not the final signs of the end of all things. He continues in verse 7, Nation will go to war against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be famines and earthquakes in many parts of the world. But all of this is only the first of the birth pains with more to come. Then you will be arrested, persecuted, and killed. You will be hated all over the world because you are my followers. So this is worldwide persecution, not persecution in parts of the world, but actual persecution in several parts of the world. And many will turn from me and betray and hate each other. And many false prophets will appear and will deceive many people. Sin will be rampant everywhere, and the love of many will grow cold. But the one who endures to the end will be saved. And this is the key portion of the scripture. And the good news of the kingdom will be preached throughout the whole world, so that all nations will hear it, and then the end will come. Now Jesus goes on to talk about in verse 15, The day is coming when you will see what Daniel the prophet spoke about, the sacrilegious object that causes desecration standing in the holy place. Reader, pay attention. Now, I believe what he's talking about here is the coming of the Antichrist who desecrates the temple. Verse 16, Then those in Judea must flee to the hills. A person out on the deck of a roof must not go down into the house to pack. A person out in the field must not return even to get a coat. How terrible it will be for pregnant women and for nursing mothers in those days. And pray that your flight will not be in winter or on the Sabbath. For there will be greater anguish than at any time since the world began, and it will never be so great again. In fact, unless that time of calamity is shortened, not a single person will survive, but it will be shortened for the sake of God's chosen ones. So it's talking about a time of great calamity. Now, there are some who believe that these words of Jesus were fulfilled in 70 AD, but I'm going to show you in the scripture why these words have not been fulfilled yet. 
Jesus continues, Then if anyone tells you, look, here is the Messiah, or there he is, don't believe it. For false messiahs and false prophets will rise up and perform great signs and wonders as to deceive, if possible, even God's chosen ones. See, I have warned you about this ahead of time. So if someone tells you, look, the Messiah is out in the desert, don't bother to go and look. Or look, he is hiding here, don't believe it. For as the lightning flashes in the east and shines to the west, so it will be when the Son of Man comes. Now has that happened yet? No. Continuing in verse 28, just as the gathering of vultures shows there is a carcass nearby, so these signs indicate that the end is near. Verse 29, immediately after the anguish of those days, the sun will be darkened, the moon will give no light, the stars will fall from the sky, and the powers in the heavens will be shaken. Has this happened yet? No. Verse 30, and then at last the sign that the Son of Man is coming will appear in the heavens, and there will be deep mourning among all the peoples of the earth, and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. Has that happened yet? No. So Jesus is talking future tense. Now, in verse, let's, let's continue to go down here. I'm going to show you just one more verse. Verse 34, he says, I tell you the truth, this generation will not pass from the scene until all these things take place. So the generation that sees these signs coming, that's the generation that will see the coming of the Lord. So, worldwide persecution of the church, it talks about the signs in the sky. There are so many things here, but ultimately, the ultimate sign is His coming on the clouds. Now, if that generation is not the generation that sees the coming of the Son of God on the clouds, then it's not the generation He's talking about here. So again, we're back to square one, which is the truth that Jesus could come today, He could come tomorrow, no man knows the hour, but He is coming. So for all the predictions that people try to make, we have to funnel it back through Matthew 24. Why? Because we take the unclear portions of Scripture and come to understand them by the clear portions of Scripture. So this is what was so powerful to me. And now I want to talk to you about the work of the Holy Spirit. This is what was so powerful to me. So from this Scripture, we know that there is coming a time when Jesus will come back. All of these signs that He described will surround his coming, they'll be leading up to his coming. They will intensify around his coming. But here's what really interested me is verse number six, where he says, but the end won't follow immediately. So don't panic just because you see certain signs. Every, every so often we go through seasons and cycles where hurricanes and earthquakes are prevalent. And there are things politically going on that seem to align with many of the interpretations that we see about Revelation or Daniel or Isaiah and so forth. But we have to remain at peace and we have to discern, not by what we see, but what we see in Scripture. And so, yes, the filter of our reality is the Scripture and we have to look and see what the Scripture clearly teaches on these issues. So don't panic, but also don't be apathetic. Just be alert. Just be vigilant. But what's interesting to me is verse 6, like I said, he said, the end won't follow immediately. And then in verse number 14, this is what is so powerful. He says, and the good news about the kingdom will be preached throughout the whole world so that all nations will hear it, and then the end will come. The sign of His coming, the primary marker of His return, is not the chaos of the world, it's the commission of the church. What does this tell me? God is in control. It is not the war. It's not the rumors of wars, the natural disasters, the political unrest, the economic instability, the signs in the sky. These are not the primary signs of His return. They lead up to His return, yes. So use them wisely. Be discerning. Be alert. Don't be caught off guard. But what we're looking for is the gospel being spread all throughout the world. Now, why is that? This is because the work of the Holy Spirit, now hear me here, the work of the Holy Spirit must be completed before Jesus can return. The commission of the church must be fulfilled. The mandate He gave to us must be fulfilled before He can return. So it is not the chaos that dictates the return of the Son of God. It's the commission. It's the preaching of the gospel. This means that light is in control, not darkness. This is not a time to become fearful. 
This is a time to become bold in our proclamation of the gospel of Jesus Christ. I'm not talking about the self-help garbage that has permeated the church and has castrated the body of Christ. I'm talking about the true power of the Holy Spirit that comes in fullness, that brings transformation, that brings about miracles. I'm talking about the preaching of the blood of Jesus, repentance from sin, the cross. I'm talking about the gospel. And that must be preached to the ends of the earth and then the end will come. Now, I really believe that before the end comes, there's going to be this season of grace because in Matthew 24, verses 37 to 39, the scripture says, when the Son of Man returns, it will be like in the, it was in the days of Noah. In those days before the flood, the people were enjoying banquets and parties and weddings right up to the time Noah entered his boat. People didn't realize what was going to happen until the flood came and swept them all away. That is the way it will be when the Son of Man comes. So there is this period of grace, there is this period of peace, but then suddenly will come calamity. And so I liken this to what we see in the book of Joel. Now this is what's so powerful. So the Holy Spirit wants to complete His work, wants to complete the commission. His job is to spread the gospel. We see in Joel 2 that the Holy Spirit was poured out or that the Holy Spirit was promised as a gift from the Father, and then in Acts 2, that the Holy Spirit is poured out as a fulfillment of the prophetic word in Joel. Now, Joel has a dual meaning. There's a prophetic meaning and an immediate application for Israel. We're not going to get into that, but I do want to show you something. In Joel chapter 1, verse 10, this is powerful. You're going to love this. He's talking about the last days prophetically. In Joel chapter 1, verse 10, Joel describes the state of God's people before the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. You're going to love this. Joel chapter 1, verse 10. The fields are ruined. The land is stripped bare. The grain is destroyed. The grapes have shriveled. And the olive oil is gone. This is so powerful. What is Joel describing here? Look at this. The grain is destroyed. What was the grain? What was the harvesting of the grain? It was Pentecost. That's the Holy Spirit. The grapes have shriveled. What does Ephesians tell us? Be not drunk with wine, but be filled. What do the grapes represent? What does wine represent? The Holy Spirit. And the olive oil is gone. What does the oil represent? It represents the Holy Spirit. Joel is describing a state of God's people where the Holy Spirit is absent from their work. He's prophetically describing our day in which the church is rejecting the person of the Holy Spirit. In these last days, we must say, welcome Holy Spirit. In these last days, we must say, Holy Spirit, we surrender. We must allow the Holy Spirit to run our churches, our ministries, and our lives. Then in Joel chapter 2, Verse 28, we see that the Holy Spirit is poured out. Then after doing all those things, I will pour out my Spirit upon all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy, your old men will dream dreams, and your young men will see visions. In those days, I will pour out my Spirit, even on servants, men and women. Now, what's interesting in Joel chapter 1, Joel is describing the state of their crops having been destroyed. And then in Joel chapter 2, He's describing the Holy Spirit being poured out like rain to bring those crops back to life. And I will cause wonders in the heavens and on the earth, blood and fire and columns of smoke. The sun will become dark and the moon will turn blood red before the great and terrible day of the Lord arrives. Now, I love this, but everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. This is what the Holy Spirit does in the last days. Just before that happens, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Now, I want to show you one more thing concerning the Holy Spirit and the last days. There is so much I could talk to you about the Holy Spirit and the last days. But, you know, I like to keep these videos relatively short so that you, you get it all in bits and pieces and I give it to you as we go. But 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 1-4, through 4, this is so powerful the way the scripture describes it. Now, dear brothers and sisters, let us clarify some things about the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and how we will be gathered to meet Him. Don't be so easily shaken or alarmed, 
by those who say that the day of the Lord has already begun. Don't believe them, even if they claim to have had a spiritual vision, a revelation, or a letter supposedly from us. Don't be fooled by what they say, for that day will not come until there is a great rebellion against God and the man of lawlessness is revealed, the one who brings destruction. So this is what Jesus was talking about, that destruction, that desolation in Matthew 24. This, I believe, is the coming of the Antichrist. And then we'll have to do a whole different lesson for that if you want me to. He will exalt himself and defy everything that people call God and every object of worship. He will even sit in the temple of God, claiming that he himself is God. There again, that's the desolation. Now, don't you remember that I told you about all this when I was with you? And you know what is holding him back. For he can be revealed only when his time comes. This is so powerful. For this lawlessness is already at work secretly, and it will remain secret until the one who is holding it back steps out of the way. In other words, the Antichrist and all of these end time events, that series of events is being suspended. The end time events are being withheld until the Holy Spirit steps out of the way. Think about this. This gospel shall be preached to the ends of the earth, and then the end will come. The man of lawlessness will not come until the person, the one holding him back, steps out of the way. The fulfillment of the commission is the completion of the Holy Spirit's work in the earth. And when he steps out of the way, chaos enters. There's coming a day when the Holy Spirit will quietly leave this earth. There's coming a day when the Holy Spirit will no longer convict the sinner of his sin, will no longer draw men to Christ. He will leave them to the debasement of their own sin and the stubbornness of their own hearts. Seek him while he still may be found. When the Holy Spirit leaves, chaos enters. When the Holy Spirit moves out of the way, the man of lawlessness comes, chaos comes, the end time events come into full effect. But by this time, the return of the Lord has already happened. Imagine the day when the conscience of mankind is no longer convicted by the Holy Spirit. That day is coming, but for now we have grace. For now, in this window of opportunity, look, I don't know when the Lord is returning. Neither do you, and neither does anybody on YouTube or on Facebook or anybody who claims any of that knowledge. You have to believe Jesus over everyone else. And ask yourself why you believe such things when they make predictions. It's because you're afraid that they might be right. Based in fear. That's what their doctrines are based in. This is based in truth, the Word of God. Now, I don't know if these are the last days. But I know that today is somebody's last day. And that is enough for me to preach the gospel with urgency. The work of the Holy Spirit in the last days is a beautiful outpouring. There is going to be a sweeping in of souls on a mass scale, such as history has never seen. And then the end will come. So don't be afraid. Don't be worried. You believe in God. You believe in Jesus. Let their perfect love cast out all fear. Don't be afraid. The Holy Spirit is at work in these last days. Well, I want to pray with you now that God would strengthen you in these times. Father, in Jesus' name, I pray for that one watching, that one receiving this prayer. And I ask, Lord, that you would strengthen us, that you would cast out all fear. Thank you for bringing clarity to this issue, Lord. And thank you for anointing us for these last days. The peace of God, the 
The kingdom of God is righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost. Receive his peace today. Receive peace in your heart. Everything is under his authority. Well, that'll do it for the lesson now. I want to welcome now the new members of Spirit Church. There you are up on the screen. And if you'd like to find out how you can join the Spirit family, then go ahead and use the information at the bottom of the screen. Join today. It's free. You receive a weekly teaching. You get email, prayer support. Do that today. I want to read now the comments. These are the comments from last week's lesson, which was seven trials of the called on and the, the test of blessings. Now, I'm going to return to this series eventually. I may do one more lesson on the end times and then return to the seven trials of the called teaching, or I may return to the seven trials of the called teaching next week. It's however the Lord leads me. Bodybuilding for Christ writes, Amen. I gave up my job and followed God's purpose for my life, not knowing that God had to pull out everything that was planted. I am grateful for these videos as they were used by the Lord to show me what was going on in this season. Ann Ober writes, I thank God for this message. It was a rebuke to me as well as an exhortation. Now I understand the test I am going through. God bless and increase your ministry. Karen Grace writes, thank you, Brother David, for this powerful message. Every teaching that you shared with us gave a revelation to my life. I really do understand now that we encounter such challenges and trials in our life because God wants to test our faith for the blessings waiting for us. Indeed, he is a good father. Thank you and more power to your ministry. God bless. Another commenter writes, God bless you, Pastor David. I was richly blessed. While you prayed, I felt the move of God through the phone. It was refreshing. Yes, many people watching Encounter TV can feel the power of the Holy Spirit moving through any medium. And that is one of the things that makes our ministry very unique. And I'm so grateful to the Lord for his ministry. And the final commenter writes, Hello, Brother David. Thank you for another amazing lesson you've given. Every lesson you've shared has always given a great revelation in my life. I pray and declare that you will continue to impact and win more souls. God bless. Well, I believe that we are going to win more souls together. You know that's my heart. That's what I want to do. I need your help. So here's how you can help the ministry and come stand alongside me and help me spread the gospel all around the world. Our ministry entered a campaign several months ago in order to get into a new ministry facility and to expand our events. So let me just break it down to you very simple. We need a thousand new $30 a month partners. Here's where we are with that. Look at how close we are to our goal. We needed a thousand new $30 a month supporters. And now we are much closer than ever before. Thanks to your response. And thank you for your obedience to the Lord. Now, where is that monthly support going to go? It's very simple. This campaign is about raising our monthly support so that we can do more events to win more souls and so that we can get into our new ministry facility so that we can do greater production more often so that we can win more souls. Now, the cool thing about that facility is we're actually going to be able to accommodate a studio audience where you can come in and join the services on a weekly basis. We'll also broadcast live. I also want to do 24-7 prayer room there. There's so much I want to do. And there's so much that God has placed in my heart and we're going to do it together. You watch, this ministry is just in the beginning stages. Partner with me today. Help me win souls. You'll be able to say, I was there from the beginning. And one day you and I together, with your support, we're going to be packing stadiums and winning thousands to Jesus. Mark my words. You're going to see that day. You will see that day. So come alongside me. Let's win souls in these last days. Let's not be so distracted. And when you become a $30 a month supporter, I'm going to send you either Carriers of the Glory or 25 Truths About Demons and Spiritual Warfare. I'll sign it and send it to you as my thank you gift for signing up to become my partner. Those of you watching on YouTube can wait until the very end of this video and you're going to be able to click the red button at the end of this video. If you're watching this on the app, just wait for the video to end. It will go away and there will be a button that says Partner with David. If you're watching this anywhere else besides the app or YouTube, use the information at the bottom of the screen. Sign up to become a partner today. If this ministry has blessed you, if you've been refreshed by this ministry, then partner with me. Spirit Church, I need your support. Many of our Spirit Church members Remember, Spirit Church is free, but many of our Spirit Church members have not signed up to support us. I'd encourage you to do so if you consider this your church. Sign up monthly for your tithe. Sign up monthly for a monthly gift. Do something today. Monthly gifts and one-time gifts are appreciated. Help me get 
the gospel out and win souls. Do that today. Well, that is it for this edition of Spirit Church. Until next time, remember, nothing is impossible with God. Thank you for watching Encounter TV. Don't forget to subscribe. Also, help me win souls by spreading the gospel through events and media. Make a one-time donation or become a monthly supporter by clicking on the donate link now.